Good morning. Welcome to Rejoice Church. Would you stand with us as we sing this morning? Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us as we forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done, on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. Before you're seated, would you turn around, shake someone's hand, let them, glad to, let them know you're glad to see them today. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. So glad that you're here. Welcome to Rejoice Church. Uh, if you are visiting today, uh, we have today's baptism Sunday, in case you didn't know that, but a lot of you, I think, do. We have a lot of guests today who are here to, to witness this and support their friend or their family, so we're so glad that you're here. Uh, but if this is your, your first time here, I want to introduce myself if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet. My name is Aaron. I serve as a pastor here at Rejoice Church, and I'd love to connect with you at some point before you leave today to say hi and tell you we're glad that you're here. In fact, if you're visiting with us today, uh, you'll see on the back of the chairs in front of you a QR code or an actual card. It's called a Connect card. You're willing to scan that, fill out any kind of basic information about yourself, or write it down. After service, out these doors to the right is called our info wall. We'll have some there, someone there to greet you. 
And if you turn that card in or if you tell them you did it online, we have a free gift for you just to say thank you uh, for being here to worship with us today. We hope that we can be an encouragement to you. On the back side of that card is a prayer request option. And so if you have things that you are burdened for, you need prayer for, write that stuff down. You can turn it into me. You can leave it on your chair. Whatever it might be, we will gather that and we will pray over those things this week. I promise we do that every single week. And so please take advantage of that ministry here. Uh, we love to, to cover things in prayer whenever we can. All right? Uh, in a couple of weeks, we, have, we are participating in something called For Columbia. And maybe you've done this before, maybe you haven't, but For Columbia is a citywide service project where a lot of churches kind of rally together on the last Saturday of April, and we serve the city. And so there's options to, uh, to get involved. It's a good option for families. So if you have kids, uh, young and old, they can be a part of this. There's different kinds of projects they can be a part of. So if you're interested in that or you have questions about that, after service, go out to the info wall, and you'll see Carly. Carly will be out there, and she will answer questions. Or if you want to register for that event, uh, she can take care of that for you as well. Because today, I believe, is the last day for those registrations. So please, uh, make sure you go talk to her. We love to encourage people to serve in any way we possibly can, especially when it means we can serve our city, okay? Well, I want to read a psalm. I read this this week in my, my time with the Lord, Psalm 111. And I want to read this before we go into our time of worship through our giving. But this is what the psalmist writes in Psalm 111. He says, Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart, in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused the wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen. Well, let's pray, and then we will continue worship through our giving. Father, we thank you again for the privilege of just gathering in your house. Um, Lord, again, for 2,000 years, your church has been a gathering people, and we get to do that on a weekly basis. And God, help us not to take that for granted. Lord, I know there's a lot of people here today that maybe this is their first time in a church, or it's been a first time in a long time. They're here to celebrate a friend or a family member, to witness just a testimony of what you've done in their life. But I pray that you will just, Lord, your spirit will work in all of us today. As we worship, as we sing, but also as we preach the word and learn from your word, help us to be attentive and that you ultimately will be glorified as a result of us gathering and celebrating today. So God, we thank you again as we, as we continue to worship through our giving. Help us to have attitudes that are cheerful, uh, not out of compulsion or out of obligation, but to give back to you because you have richly blessed us. So God, we thank you again for your blessing. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Psalm 34, verse 4 through 8. It says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. This morning we're going to introduce a new song to you. It's called Trust in God. And it's from these verses in Psalm 34. We're going to have some baptisms here in a little while. And it's a celebration of those who have called on the name of the Lord, who now no longer live in shame, but have the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Would you stand with us as we introduce this new song? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps. So this is my story, and this is my song. I'm praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. Sing it, church. I trust in God, my Savior. the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered that's why I trust him that's why I trust him I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered that's why I trust him, that's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail. never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard and he answered that's why i trust him that's why i trust him i sought the lord and he heard and he answered i sought the lord and he heard and he answered i sought the lord and he heard and he answered that's why i trust him that's why i trust in god my savior the one who will never Fail. I trust in God, sing it out, my Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail, I trust 
thankful for his faithfulness and his goodness this morning. Thanks for singing with us. You may be seated. Kids who want to be dismissed to kids' worship, you may go now. Well, this is an exciting morning. I'm looking forward to all the, the celebration in just a little bit. But we have some other things I'd like to talk about as well. Well, there are celebrations that are involved, by the way. Uh, but last week, we started a, a new sermon series called More Than Short Stories. And what we've been looking into are the parables of Jesus. And maybe you don't know what a parable is, but simply stated, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So it's a very relatable and very applicable story that is meant to convey an eternal truth to the audience listening. And so last week, we began this sermon series by looking into what probably is considered the most famous of Jesus' parables. It's called the story of the Good Samaritan. And this is how it was set up. So Jesus is teaching, and there's a, a lawyer, an expert in the Jewish law, who approaches Jesus, and he asks him a question. He says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus, knowing he's a lawyer, he says, well, you are an expert in the law. You read it. What do you see? And he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus commends this man for giving the right answer. He says, absolutely, do this and you will live. But Scripture tells us that this guy, he wanted to justify something in himself that he was already actively engaging in, as well as the culture around him. And that was this understanding or this assumption that, look, there are some people that are neighbors, and there are a lot of people that are not. And so he asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Hoping he would get this teacher's endorsement. Like, yeah, your people are your neighbors, but everyone else that's not you is not your neighbor. But Jesus doesn't do that. He responds by telling a story. And in that story, he actually elevates the one character that would be the most hated character by those listening. It's the Samaritan man. And the Samaritan man is elevated to be the example of neighborliness and kindness and grace. And what this story revealed to his audience and it reveals to us it was this, that we are all meant to be a neighbor to whenever and to whomever is in front of us who's in need. And it's a very simple message, but it's a very compelling and I think very convicting message. And that's just the masterfulness of Jesus' teaching. Well, today we're going to look at a few parables as well, but it, these are parables about finding something precious that was once lost. Has anybody ever lost something of value? You misplaced it or you lost it, whatever. It might, maybe it's something that was sentimental. Uh, maybe it was something that had actually a lot of value, like monetarily, a value to it, whatever. But you lose it. And you can have this sick feeling in your stomach that you know it's gone, right? But maybe you've lost something precious, but you had the privilege of rediscovering it. You found it again. And if you remember what that's like, it's like this, this overwhelming sense of relief. You have mixed emotions. You have joy, overwhelmed, uh, you're rejoicing and celebrating. It's awesome, right? Well, in the Pontius household over the years, uh, we've had many moments of lost and found, and those who have little kids understand this, like the little things like, oh, I lost my homework. Oh, look, I found it in my backpack that I never looked in, right? That place, uh, those kinds of lost and moment celebratory moments. Um, but there's also some really sweet ones too. And I want to share with you a very sweet lost something precious, but then found celebration um, from years ago. Go ahead and play it. Are you excited? Yeah. Yeah. 
cold nights, uh, him waking up, looking for Robot, forgetting he lost him, and then screaming because he can't find him, and mom and dad waking up. Uh, and so when Beckham, when we found Robot, there was a great, like, I loved by the end, at the end he showed his other stuffed animals that he looked who he found, you know. Uh, but that video is only a minute long, but there was a lot more celebration that you didn't see. Like, people that would come into our house for the next two weeks, he'd be like, look who I found. You know, they don't even know what he's talking about. And so there was a lot of celebration for him, but there was a lot of celebration for mom and dad, too. Let's just be real honest. And uh, it's, it's so simple. It's something so small. But, like, to, my, to a three-year-old who doesn't, he only understands life as he sees it, and as he's experienced it, robot was a very important part of his life. And it was something that was so precious to him that was lost and it was displaced. But when, there was, when he was found, sweet reunion, as you've seen, right? And what we're going to look at today, Jesus conveys this same kind of experience, but in a much deeper level. It's on the heart level of every one of us. And he's going to give three stories about something that was very precious that was lost. But in, every th- in all stories, it's found, okay? But in order to understand the significance of why Jesus shares these stories, we need to understand the context of what was going on. Because it's not like Jesus just spontaneously broke out into this story. It was always connected to a question or to a conversation. But in this case, it was actually connected to an accusation. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, we'll have it on the screens. But in Luke 15, we're going to read the whole thing, um, and we'll read through it quickly, but the first two verses, they set up the rest of all of this chapter. And look at these first two verses in Luke 15, starting in verse 1. It says this. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners, for those who aren't aware, tax collectors were always clumped in with sinners because they were hated people. They were seen as traitors. They were Jewish people working for the Roman government, getting a kickback financially for serving the emperor while taking from their own people. They hated them. So the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Him is Jesus. Verse 2 says, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. So here you have religious leaders who are looking at what's happening, and they're disgusted by it. They say, this guy receives them, and he invites them, and he eats with them. So the first two verses set up the rest of chapter 15, because the rest of this chapter is Jesus answering these accusations, or this accusation from this, these scribes and Pharisees. And in, in verse 1, it says, all of these people, these sinners, these tax collectors, they were all drawing near to him. They wanted to learn from him. They heard about him. Maybe they witnessed some of the things that he performed. They wanted to be near him. And so Jesus was making a place for them at his table. And he was encouraging them. And he was uh, serving them. And he asked them to join him at the table for a meal. Now, what's super fascinating about this word receives in the English language, the, the writer Luke he wrote, he wrote a handful of, of, of books in the New Testament, and out of all of his writings, only six times does this word appear. It's this Greek word that's pronounced prosdekomai. Only six times does he use this word prosdekomai, and every single time this word is used, it is literally translated to mean this, to eagerly await or to expect and to look for. To eagerly await or to expect or to look for. That's what receives actually translates to. So in other words, Luke 15, 2 says that Jesus is not just receiving sinners. He is looking for them. It means that he is eagerly awaiting their arrival. His eye is out for them. So that word receive kind of carries this kind of passive connotation in our language. But we know that Jesus was never passive. And so in this right here, he is seeking sinners to come to him and to join him. That's what's happening. And so these religious leaders accuse him of this. They're disgusted by this. And all the rest of of the chapter is Jesus' explanation to them of what is really happening, of what's really going on when he welcomes sinners to eat with them at the table. So let's look at these stories. Let's start with the first story, verse 3. It says, So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, If he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together all of his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, 
For I have found my sheep that was lost. Now look at verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. That's story number one. Look at story number two, starting in verse eight. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, and she says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Now notice verse 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So let's pause here. So from the first story, Jesus' answer to him receiving sinners is like a shepherd who finds a lost sheep, and then he calls his friends, and they celebrate with him because he found it. And then the second story, what Jesus' answer is, in that his receiving of sinners is like the woman in this story who finds the lost coin, calls all of her friends together, and then celebrates together because she found also what she lost. And in both of these answers, Jesus leaves no doubt about what he is implying. In fact, verse 7 and 10, he's very intentional to, to reveal to his accusers that the lost sheep and the lost coin, they represent lost people. They represent lost sinners. And the being found represents this word known as repentance. And then the celebration is what God and the angels are doing in those moments. And so they're celebrating because a lost sinner has now been found. And a lost sinner who was once unrepentant now takes a repentant posture. And because of that repentance, heaven is throwing a party. That's what this is talking about. So in this moment, there's some people listening to that, this conversation that totally get what he's talking about. But there are a lot of people there that don't get it. But what Jesus is essentially saying is he's saying, look, I welcome sinners because I am the incarnation of God's love pursuing them. I am actively looking for them. I am seeking those who are lost. I am the shepherd seeking the sheep. I am the woman in the story seeking her coin. And he says this meal that we are eating together is just a glimpse of what is happening in heaven right now. It's a foretaste of the joy that is yet to come. So when sinners turn from their sin and they accept salvation in Christ, they accept my fellowship, he says, as the joy of their lives, what Jesus says here is that they have come home to God. And when a lost sinner is found and comes home to God, it says that God is filled with immense joy. This is what he is trying to help his accusers understand what's going on that they don't have eyes for. But again, Je Jesus is the most brilliant teacher who's ever lived, and in his brilliance, he can read the crowd. And he understands and he sees the heart of these, these people who are making this accusation. So he tells a third story. And this third story is one that you've heard before if you've never read this before. It's one that has been told in different ways for 2,000 years. You see it in literature. You see it in articles. You see it in playwrights. You see it in cinema. This is a story not about a lost coin. It's not about a lost sheep, but it's actually about a lost son. And this lost son is found by his father. Okay? And so these, these parables have three things in common. Something's lost, that something is found, and it's followed by great joy. All three of them. The lost sheep is found, followed by a party. The lost coin is found, it's followed by a party. In just a moment, you're going to read this lost son is found, and it's followed by a party, all right? And this is a very, very powerful, powerful story. Starting in verse 11. And we'll spend most of our time here. It says, and he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pod that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So in other words, he was so hungry that the pig slop looked appetizing. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your, head, your hired servants. And he arose 
And he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he felt compassion, and he ran, and he embraced him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. And it says they began to celebrate. So let's stop here. This is a beautiful parable. And you've probably heard this in some way in your life. But, man, it stirs all the right kinds of emotions in us, and it's meant to. And, um, you know, I think as a, as a father, I read this and I get emotional. As a son, I read this and I get emotional. And if you think, if you are a parent, and you have the blessing of being a parent, you read this and maybe you get emotional, but you are a son or a daughter. And, you know, I don't know your experience with your parents, some of us read this story, and it's hard to read because you wish that was your reunion with your dad or with your mom, but it never was. Or maybe you get emotional because it's exactly what it was. But some of us, it's like we also think, I wish that I could have that with my kid. And so we, it, it hits all the right emotions because it's meant to, because what this story will convey is the very heart of God, right? And so this story begins with a father who has two sons, one of them comes to him and says, Dad, I want my inheritance right now. I don't want to wait anymore. And verse 12 says that. It says, The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. But what you need to understand about Jewish culture is in the Jewish culture, a family inheritance was something that was governed by certain laws and practices. So the eldest son would receive what is called a double portion. So no matter how many kids you have, the eldest son would get twice as much. So in this case, there's only two kids. There's two boys. You have the older and the younger. So the older son would get two-thirds of the father's estate, and the younger son would get one-third of the father's estate. And it says here that the youngest of the two comes to his dad, and he says, I want it right now. I don't want to wait till you kick the bucket. I want what's coming to me right now. And what's really interesting here is that the father responds by doing exactly what his younger son is demanding. Now, I don't know why he didn't try to talk him out of it. Jesus doesn't give us those details of, you know, saying that he's asked, what's your problem? Why are you acting this way? He doesn't share that with us. And look, anytime Jesus shared something or withheld something, it was always with intentionality. And so every parable that Christ ever teaches, understand that the characters within the parable, they are always meant to be illustrative to those who are listening or who are reading of certain things. They're always going to illustrate certain characteristics. They're going to illustrate certain attitudes that he's dealing with in that moment, but also that we deal with every single day, right? And so what we see here then is this younger son, he's a picture of the kind of person who wants to only do their own thing all the time. It's the kind of person who only wants to go their own way. They want to make their own, their own path. It's a person who wants to run after what they're going to run after, it's kind of this whole mantra right now. It's like, hey, you control your own destiny. You do you, right? And it sounds really great on the surface, and so a lot of people buy into that when they go for it. And it's this kind of person who just goes after the desires of the flesh. But the father in this story, he represents actually God, the father in heaven. So we have Jesus, the son of God. He's telling us this story where the father in the story represents God, the father in heaven. So he's portrayed here in this human father who's being approached by his human son saying, dad, I want what I want right now. So give it to me. And the father just gives it. Now, why would he do that? What does this reveal to us about God? Well, I think simply put, if nothing else, this speaks to us of the amazing kindness that God extends to us even when we act and live foolishly and when we live recklessly and selfishly. Like he extends this amazing grace to us. You know, I think of some of the most ridiculous decisions I've ever made in my life, and I think about like even some of the most selfish directions I've taken in my life. I look back at those moments, and you know what? God let me take them. He let me take them. He let me walk down that road. And I believe there's several reasons why he lets us do that. But for one, he, he gives us the freedom of our will. And that is something that, that's one of the things that makes us uniquely human is the freedom of our will. And he's not going to take that back from us. And so what that means is that if I choose to run away from God, 
If I choose to reject him, if I choose to reject his love, if I choose to reject his grace, if I choose to reject the salvation that that God gives us through his son, Jesus Christ, that means that God's going to let me do that. And he's going to let you do that. But what I have found to be true in my own life and my own experience is that running away from God, on the front end, it feels very freeing. It feels like, ah, freedom, finally. I can, I can control my own destiny. I can do my own thing. I can go after what I want to go after. And at first, it, found, it sounds great. It feels free. But the longer that goes on, at some point, it does lead to misery. I believe that with all my heart. It will lead to misery either in this life or after, or both. Verse 13 again says, Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property with reckless living. And again, that always feels free for a season. Maybe two, maybe ten seasons, maybe it's a long time that, you know what, this is great, I'm enjoying it. And I kind of like I kind of liken this to a, a skydive. I've never been skydiving. Some of you might have. Uh, my father-in-law has been a bunch of times, and he talks about how freeing it is. You know, it's, you're free-falling literally, and, and you can flip around and all this stuff. That sounds like a nightmare to me, but it's this sense of freedom, right? But Related to this illustration, it's a sense of freedom until you realize you forgot to pack your parachute. And then it's a problem. It's going to lead to impending misery, right? It's going to be very brief, but it's going to be miserable. So running from God, it feels very great, maybe, at first, depending on what your upbringing has been around the things of God. But when you come to verse 14, verse 14 is a reality check. Verse 14 says, and when he had spent everything... A severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. For the first time in his life, he had nothing. For the first time in his life, everything that he thought he wanted, he spent it, literally and also figuratively. And when he got to that point, the, the famine is, a, is meant to represent the harshness of life, the reality of difficulties in this life. It's real. And when you come face to face with reality, and no matter how long it takes, whether it's money, whether it's a pursuit of things that you just wanted to spend your time after and your affection after, whatever it might be, what this just shows eventually, it feels easy come, easy go at the front end, but then reality checks in. Because recklessness is always followed by desperation when you're honest. Look at verse 15. Look how desperate he became says, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He hired himself out. That's how desperate he was. He was so hungry. He was in the pig pen, and he actually considered eating the pig food. But what's interesting is that in the original Greek language, that word we use, hired, it actually means an attaching to another person. It means it's a binding yourself to another. So think of it this way. When we break our attachment with God, when we break loose from God, Whether you believe this or not, this is still true. You will end up finding yourself attached to another. It might be a person, it might be a thing, it might be a pursuit of some sort. But if you break loose from your attachment with God, you will end up attached to another. And that attachment will not be freeing in the long run. It actually leads to enslavement, not sonship. And so the attachment, it could be things that are destructive. Maybe you know people that it was all destructive stuff. And maybe it was things that or were an attempt to numb your problems or numb your pain, or maybe it was things that were done for selfish gain or selfish ambition, whatever it might be. But the attachment, it might be crude in that way, but we also know it can also be refined, right? And so the point is, if, if we break loose from God, we will be attached to another. And in the end, whether it's crude or it's refined, this attachment will eventually lead us to where we do not want to be. And that will either be in this life or after. And Jesus is just painting a real picture for us in his masterful storytelling. But we get to verse 17, and Jesus is now describing the nature of this son's heart as he begins to repent. Look at verse 17. It says this, but when he came to himself, that's how it opens, but when he came to himself. Now, what does that mean when he came to himself? Well, in, in short, it just basically means he came to his senses, right? And maybe you've had moments in your life where you're like, ah, I finally came to my senses and I realized what an idiot I've been. Or maybe you are so relieved when you find out someone else came to the senses of how silly they've been, right? But I actually can make the argument that I think it's deeper than just arriving at a better judgment. Because think of it this way. 
I really believe this. When you are estranged from God, when you are far from God, I actually believe you're also far from yourself and you don't even know it. And I know that's a bold statement, but let me just elaborate. Like when you cannot, you cannot know yourself or relate properly to yourself if you are running from the very one who made you for himself. And maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But scripture tells us that you were made by God in the image of God, but do you also know you were made for God? Every one of us. These are the three main things that when it comes to our identity as being human. You're made by God in the image of God, but you're made for him. You and I were made to enjoy friendship and fellowship with the God who made everything. That's why he made you. And he's given you experiences. He's given you skill sets to operate in that. But bottom line, all of us have different skills. All of us uh, represent different vocations maybe and different passions. But bottom line is how are you glorifying God in those vocations and passions? Because that's what you're made for. And so conversion then is a coming to yourself just as much as it is a coming to God because it's discovering where you came from. It's discovering who you are. It's also discovering why you exist. Running from God is always a running from why you were created. So repentance is us waking up to this truth. Repentance is a humble brokenness, and it's a deep sense of unworthiness before God in the right kind of way. So if you go to the story, the son, he actually rehearses the speech, doesn't he? He practices what he's going to say to his dad when, his, when he comes home to his dad. And so he recognizes that his lostness is not something that he can make excuses for. He was guilty, and so are we. Like, he was a rebel, and so are we. He knew his father's will, but he still chose to reject it. So with a repentant heart, it's a sense of understanding just the reality and the depth of the offense that we make to God, and we actually don't have any rights before him. But there's another side of repentance that's so beautiful, and that is, we get to throw ourselves on God's merciful, bountiful, free provision of grace. Like, we get to do that. He invites us to do that. The son says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. So when he came to himself, meaning when he came to the understanding, like, what am I doing? Like, I, I'm, I don't need to do this anymore. Why am I running from my dad? And he realized, I can throw myself at the mercy of my dad, and at worst, he will bring me in, and I can serve him. I can work for him, right? But I do want to point out something that I think sometimes we make a mistake when, it, when we try to come home to God. This lost son, he's willing to come home as a servant rather than a son. And does that mean that he wants to relate now to his dad as just a hired hand? Like he just wants to turn his dad from a generous father into an employer? I, I don't think that's what he wants to do. What the son is saying, essentially, look at how rich and generous my father is. Even the servants eat well. So the focus here is not on the service that this son can provide his father. The focus is on the incredible bounty and generosity that he has so foolishly traded for the fleeting pleasures of sin and selfishness. So therefore, this is what repentance is. I love this. I I borrowed this from someone. This is not originally mine. Repentance is believing that God is so great. It's believing that God is so good that the smallest enjoyments of his house are better than 10,000 houses without him. I'm going to say that again. That the repentance is believing that God is so great and he is so good that the smallest enjoyments of his house are better than 10,000 houses without him. And so the son comes to this realization. And with this changed heart, the boy heads home. And we get to verse 20, where true repentance is manifested and it's greatly celebrated. And it says, and he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he felt compassion. He ran to him and he embraced him and he kissed him. And his son, he goes into his speech, and his son says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But notice the dad interrupts his speech. And it says, the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and let's bring out the fattened calf. Let's kill it because we are going to party. My son was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, and now he is found. 
And so right here, Jesus is telling us a story that helps us understand the heart of God. And I think if you were like me, so often as a, as a young man, as a young teenager even, I just thought God, God loved me, but I better prove that I'm worthy of it. Like I had to prove, like, man, I better not mess up or else. And so it was this love that was all conditional. That's how I interpret it. Now, I, I, I wouldn't say that was true. That's how I operated in my walk with the Lord. And it's almost like the son feels the same way. Lord, I, I can't be your son. I'll just be a servant. But this heart of God, it's portrayed here. Here, here how it's portrayed. Waiting with anticipation for the son to return. I mean, how else can you see your son coming a long way off unless you're anticipating and waiting for him, unless you're absolutely watching for him? And this is exactly what Jesus is communicating to his audience and he's communicating it to us. At the heart of God, it bends towards sinners who are coming back to him. Like these are sinners who come back to the Father and they acknowledge, I have had enough of my own selfish desires. I'm done going after my selfish pursuits. I have had enough of myself. I've had enough of my own attempt to try to discover my own meaning and my own purpose without him. I've had enough of it. I just want to come home. I just want to come home. And so Jesus says here, you want to know the heart of my Father? He says he is waiting with eager anticipation for his sons and daughters to come home to him. He does not care if you smell like pigs or not. He's going to throw his arms around his child and smother them with affection. And he proudly says, you are mine. And so the son couldn't even get the full speech out of his mouth before his father says, let's celebrate. we got to celebrate. Like you've been found and you've come home. And I don't know how you see God or how you've always seen God. But maybe it's similar to how you, maybe the son assumed his father would react. If I could just get in his good graces again and just show him that I don't have to be worthy of sonship, I can just be a servant. And it's like his father didn't even let him get the sentence out. He just says, no, no, no. Let's put the best on him because my son's come home. And there's a massive party. You know, I wish sometimes that the parable ended there because there's another character. It's the older brother. And I'll be honest with you. I think more times than not in my life, I'm the older brother. Let's read verse 25. It says, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. He refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. You, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But then this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, and you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for your, this your brother was dead, but he's alive. He was lost, and he's been found. You know, I can see that, and you can tell that the oldest son is not happy at all because it felt like the celebration was an insult to his own faithfulness. And he's angry at his dad for this. And understand, the first two stories illustrate something valuable was lost and then it was found. But this is the only of the three that there's an additional character that represents the ones who were throwing the accusations at Jesus. These are the religious leaders. These are the religious elite. They're following the law, and they're making sure everyone else is too. They're around the Father. They're around God. They're around the right things, but they do not have eyes to see the big picture. And they're just disgusted that this teacher, who claims to be someone unique, is inviting this person to sit with him. But I'll be real with you. For a long time, I've read this story and I felt like the older brother had a very valid point. I look at this, it's like he never left. He was always working. He was always around. But as I've gotten older and the more I've studied this, I have come to the realization that this older brother is just another version of a life of pride and selfishness that just looks different. The younger brother, he's a rule breaker. The older brother, he's a rule keeper. And he's a people pleaser. And he just wants those to notice him and how good and holy he is. So you see, the character of the older brother is a picture of a selfish life, listen, 
who was with the Father, around the Father, but was so far away from the Father's heart. And I, I can tell you that there's been times in my life I've been that person. Judgmental, thinking that God can't save that person, he shouldn't save that person. So let me just say this. Let all of us never grow so removed from our own experience in receiving the love and grace of God through Jesus that we become irritated whenever God powerfully transforms the lives of people that we never thought he could or that we never thought he should. See, the father tells his oldest son that there's no reason to begrudge his little brother. There's no reason to be resentful. It was fitting to celebrate because his brother was dead, but he's now alive. He was lost and he's now found. And so the theme of these parables, it's about the heart of God. It's about this graciousness of God that overshadows the foolishness of our own sin in our lives. So the lost child, he was looking to return home just to be a servant. He wanted to earn it. He wanted to show, hey, I, am this, I, I can be worthy of it. I can earn your favor. But instead, he was restored as a son. And the same is true for any of you. If you come back to the Lord, if you're following or you're wandering from God, he will restore you not as a servant. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to prove his affection for you. He'll restore you as a child of God. And he will embrace you, and he will love you, and he will celebrate you that a child has come home. And so what will you find if you turn home to God through Jesus? First, you'll know that God is not too busy with other things, that he's not concerned about his lost children, right? All of his affairs are in order. Everything's taken care of. He is free to be concerned about every single one of his lost children. Therefore, Because of this, anyone else, before anyone else sees you coming, God has already seen you coming up the horizon. He sees you from far away. He is free to be concerned about you. He knows every tremor, every heartache, every fear of your soul. He sees you. He will run towards you. He will embrace you. He will celebrate you. And here we see a lavish welcome of a father in this story. It's the best robe because it's the robe of sonship not enslavement. And the robe of full, enthusiastic, and unrestrained restoration to the family. That is the way the Father is when you or me, when we come home. And God is very, very glad when he sees you walking towards him. Very glad. So when Jesus receives sinners and he invites them to the table, like it is the gladness of the Father that is gathering in his lost children, and it's Christ, is he aw- and he's awaiting for you to join him at the table. So the question is, do you see, are you in a mess? Have you come to your senses? Have you come to yourself? And are you willing to go home? Because that is where you'll find the greatest peace and fulfillment and true joy that you'll ever experience in this world. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, you are so good to us, truly. And Lord, we get to celebrate just a handful of lives this this morning that have been transformed, who have come home. Lord, people who were lost and didn't know it, but then have been found, who were dead but now have been made alive. And we get to celebrate that visually and publicly through baptism in just a few moments. But God, I am not too naive to to think that there could be some even in this room right now who are very much in that category of the younger son who just want to do their own thing have been doing their own thing and it feels freeing maybe they're in a season of freedom right now and it feels great and they don't need the things that we're talking about but lord i also know that you have still made them in your image for you and to know you and to draw to you so I just pray, Father, if there's anyone in this room that is wrestling with this right now and they, they know they need to repent, they know they need to turn around and go home, I pray that your spirit will help them see that today. That they can give their life to you. Sinner, broken, but come to you and you will embrace them and welcome them. They place their faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, some of us in this room might be the second brother. We get so frustrated and get so judgmental sometimes looking around this world and looking around even this room and thinking, surely there's no hope for that person. But God, help us to not be so close to the things of God, but never be connected to the heart of God. Help us to see things that we need to see. 
so that we can celebrate the things that we need to celebrate as well. So, Father, I pray that you will work in a mighty way this morning in our hearts, in our minds. Help us to have ears to listen and eyes to see the things that you want us to, to listen and hear and the things that you want us to see. And help us to be willing to make the choice, the decision to just surrender to you. And we thank you. And it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. You know, in just a, in just a moment, we're going to, to do baptisms as well, but we're going to continue singing. And first, before we kind of do some, some changes in here, I want to just say, if this is you this morning, and maybe you're here because you're here to support somebody, but you needed to hear this message, and maybe you have a decision that you need to make, or it's, it, you feel a stirring in your heart, well, let me just tell you, if you feel that stirring, I really believe it's the Spirit of God that is calling you to Himself. And you don't, may not know what that even means. But before you leave today, like as we sing, you can find a friend. If you came with a friend who is a believer and can help you pray or pray with you, man, take advantage of that. If you need to come talk to me after service, I can pray with you or someone else that you know that is a follower of Christ. Man, we want to serve you. If you have questions, we want to help you with that. Because we really believe that this is the most important decision you can make in your life. It's a return home to the Father, okay? The second thing is this. I mentioned it in my prayer, but we're about to witness the transformation uh, of people um, that God has done in people's hearts through baptism, and it's a, it's a celebration, man. And so because it's a celebration, we want every generation to be in this room. And so in just a moment, we're going to sing, and as we sing, you're going to see leaders. In fact, we got a few kids in here already. You're going to see some leaders bring in kids, and they're going to bring them to their moms and dads and grandparents or whoever, uh, because we want every person in this building to be a part of the celebration and it's going to be loud it's going to be chaotic and we don't care okay and so if you have crying kids let them cry if you have cheering kids let them cheer this is going to be fun and uh, so if, if you have kids they're going to be coming out if you have nursery kids though as we dismiss uh, the, those who need to change for baptism you can go ahead and do that um, as we sing if you have a nursery kid if you don't mind going to the nursery and bringing them back in and then join us in worship and we'll come back in just a few minutes okay so let's all stand as we continue through song.
as warm as I hoped. <laughs> on? Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> it's all right. I'm waiting on a mic. I left a mic in my room. Thanks, buddy. Okay. I think it's working. So, this is exciting. Oh, uh, man, this is this is, if every Sunday could be like this, how awesome would that be? But we're so thankful for the Sundays God gives us, these kind of moments. And uh, I just want to give, first of all, before we, we have the baptisms take place, I want to kind of just give us a, an overview of what this means for us. Um, you know, we believe in baptism by immersion here at Joyce Church, and let me explain to you why. Um, baptism by immersion represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So Christ died uniquely. He died in a vertical position right, because he was hanging on a cross. You don't normally die in a vertical position, but he did. And so when we're standing in the water, we are representing the, like, the vertical position represents the cross of Jesus. And so we're identifying in the death of Jesus in those moments, right? But then when Jesus died, he was buried and put into a tomb, and he was laid to rest in a tomb. So when we go under the water, it is a representation of that we are also identifying in the burial of Christ. But then Christ didn't stay that way, did he? A few days later, he walked out in a vertical position out of that tomb, and he never to die again. And so when we come back out of the water, it represents, one, we are identifying the cross of Jesus, we're identifying in the burial of Jesus, and we are identifying in this new life that we get to walk in in the person of Jesus. And so that's what this means. And so we have a handful of people this morning that have given their life to Christ. They have professed their faith in Jesus Christ, and I think I have, I've already seen in them a transformation over time, but we all know that this isn't something that just happens overnight, that God is constantly growing us and that we get to be a part of that for the rest of our lives. But this is a, pro, a public proclamation of an inward change that God has done through the person of Jesus, right? And so to get to be a part of that is a joyful occasion. So I want to hear some shouting this morning, and let's... let's Man, let's not be quiet. Like, when we see something happen, let's celebrate, all right? 
So I want to invite, uh, where's Dylan? Is Dylan in here? Come on up, Dylan. You can give it, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> he's making his way. <clears throat> so Dylan, uh, Dylan Ferguson, he's been a part of our church for a little while. Actually, I learned this after um, he's been here for uh, several months, but he used to be here. You can come on in. It's nice and warm. <laughs> the top's warm. The, the bottom is receiving. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dylan, he, he was a part of this church when he was a teenager, and, uh, and he, he gave his life to the Lord when he was a kid, but he, he says that in the last recent years, he really has wanted to follow Christ, and he has rededicated his life, and uh, he's married and has a family, and he wants to be uh, the spiritual leader in his home, and he wants to be a good example to them, and so he has expressed to me that he has professed his faith in Jesus, he's walking with Jesus, and, uh, and so we get to be a part of celebrating this next step of obedience in his life, all right? So I do want to ask you some public questions, uh, professions. So four questions, all right? Yep. So do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Do you believe that he was buried and rose again? Yes, I do. And have you asked him to be Lord of your life? Yes, I have. Amen, man. Yes. Let's do this, all right? Come on in. Come and turn to this way. Thank you. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize my brother, Dylan, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on up. Yeah. So Stephanie has been here for several months now with, with Dylan and their kids, and she has told me that she has given her life to Christ two years ago, uh, but she has not taken that next step of, of a public uh, believer's baptism, and so we are so glad uh, to have her today. Uh, she has expressed uh, her profession of faith in Jesus, and she too wants to be a, a role model to her, her kids and to her family, and they have a lot of, of visitors here to, to support them, and so we're excited to, to get to do that today as well. Come on in. Not there. Nope. Woo! That's a North Pole. Okay. So. Got it. Do it's cold. So we are, again, we're excited about what God's doing in this family. Um, to see mom and dad get baptized together is a wonderful blessing. And a great testimony to everyone who's here, but also to their friends and family who are here to support them. And so we're so proud of you. And I want to ask you some questions for public profession as well. Okay. So do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Do you believe that he was buried and rose again? Yep. And have you asked him to be Lord of your life? Yes, sir. Amen. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize my sister, Stephanie, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's pretty cool, huh? You want to you feel it? <laughs> awesome. Well, at this time, I want to invite uh, Mark Dishert to come on up. Yeah. Like a hot tub? <laughs> yeah. Keep telling yourself that. <clears throat> oh, man. This is exciting. Um, so, Mark has professed his faith in Jesus, and let me just take a few steps back here for a second. Uh, Mark was one of the first people that I met outside of the church when we moved here a couple of years ago, and uh, I think it was in our first real conversation. Um, he found out I was a pastor, and he very kindly told me he was an atheist. He was kind. He wasn't a rude about it at all. He was very kind about it, but 
it just started a, a, uh, a conversation, and what he didn't know at the time is from that moment on, myself and I called a, a handful, texted a handful of people that I know are prayer warriors. We began to pray for Mark every day by name. And uh, about a year later, I remember sitting across the lunch table. We went to lunch together, and I heard him say for the first time that he believed this is true. And uh, Mark gave his life to Christ that day. And uh, someone who was once very much against to now a brother, it's just so encouraging and exciting. And, um, man, so proud of you and what God's done in your life. Man. Love you, brother. And uh, love you all. <laughs> Um, you know, in the kinds of challenges that have been uh, part of their experience this year has been tough, but it's so amazing to see how God has been a part of that every step of the way. And that God has been doing miracles upon miracles in their life, and, uh, and we're so thankful for what uh, he's done in Mark, but also his family. And so we get to count them. We get to count the miracles. That's right. <laughs> That's right, brother. So I ask you some questions as well, man. Yes, sir. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Died on the cross for your sins. Yes. Ask him to be Lord of your life. I do. Thank you. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize my brother, Mark Fisher, in the name of the Father, the Son. So, Charlotte is Mark and Mallory's daughter, and uh, she too has professed her faith in Jesus, and um, such a blessing, you know, um, and Mark's in here for a reason. Um, so, moms and dads, whether you know this or not, or whether you care to hear this or not, you are the spiritual leaders of your home, and um, for the good or the bad, and, but when, when a parent chooses to follow Christ, and then a child makes that decision on their own as well, what a blessing it is to watch that and to experience that. And so there's nothing in Scripture that says only pastors can baptize. And so Mark is going to baptize his daughter this morning, okay? All right, I'll pray. Okay. Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Amen. All right. Thank you. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we baptize our sister Charlotte. And let's give all of them a round of applause again. Hey, this is what it's about. You know, we, we get to follow Christ. We get to. You have the privilege of following Jesus, man. And never count out your testimony. Some of you feel like you don't have a testimony that's interesting and that's worth being heard, but I tell you, that's a lie from the enemy. You absolutely do. Any life that's been transformed by Jesus is a walking testimony of the goodness of Jesus. And so, whether you're young or old, Christ transforms lives, and so we praise God for that, all right? So we're going to invite you, we're going to sing one more song, let's stand up, and it's a celebration, let's do this together.
what your testimony is. Would you share that with someone this week? Whether the Lord has rescued you from something that is just despairing or if you have been raised in church and been in close walk with him all your life, you have a story to tell and God wants to use that. Would you share that this week? Thank you so much for being here. You first time guests, make sure you go out these doors and to the right to the info wall. Get your free gift for uh, just to say thanks for being with us. If there's something that we can be praying with you about and for you about, use that QR code or fill out one of those comment cards. We'd love to connect with you. And we want to celebrate. Anybody love little buntlets? Wow. Okay. I'm going to eat yours then. If you didn't just yell, we want to celebrate. Stick around. We've got some buntlets out here. Grab one of those. Make sure you hug the necks of those who were baptized today. They're bunt cakes. Tiny little bunt cakes. Buntlets, Jeanette. Bunt. Buntinis, whatever it is. We want to celebrate. Hug the necks of those who were baptized. We love you, Rejoice Church. Thanks for being with us this morning. You may be dismissed. Mm -hmm.